Aaron, thanks for joining me. How are you today? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Today I have Aaron with me and uh, I have the pleasure of working with Aaron. So maybe Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself? I, I'm happy to, but before I do, can I say that I love the intro that you put okay. together for this? I don't know where you came up with that, but the music is great and the animations are super cool. So way to go. Um, yeah, so I am Aaron Schlim. I am a solution architect here at We Localize and I specialize in AI solutions. So I work with companies to figure out how can we optimize the process of collecting data um, that you will use to train or test uh, your different AI products um, and services. So that's a pretty simple version of it, but um, you know, we'll step into lots of details. I also spend a lot of time thinking about computational linguistics and NLP problems, because that tends to be a part of the big picture yeah. of how you solve data problems. Yeah. And so tell me, what's the day in the life of Aaron? Like you wake up, you've got customers. What What does a uh, solutions architect or someone in your field do daily? Yeah, so there's kind of a split. On the one hand, there's time that gets spent with clients. So yeah. a big part of what we do in the solutions team is to read client specifications, talk to clients about not just the specifications and the data, but also about what are you trying to build, right? Yeah. What are your objectives? Who is your market? Um, you know, a good example of something like that is let's say a client wants us to build a data set around conversational AI. Yeah. And they wanted to build it in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a big world. The world of Spanish is could be a whole lot of things. And we need some information about who are the users? Who are these people? Do they only speak Spanish? Do they live in Chile? Do they live in Los Angeles? Did they yeah. grow up speaking English and Spanish? Like, so there's a lot of questions that need to go into understanding the nature of the product, who it's going to serve, and then a bunch of questions about, okay, well, like, what does this data need to look like? You know, yeah. in order for your data science team to use it, what do we need to deliver to you? Um, and sometimes there's good questions that we can ask that are, that are around like, okay, well, why? Why do you want the data to look like that? You know, and obviously client is king and, you know, the client knows what they want, but it's a really good way to generate some interesting conversation that I think is often fruitful for our client yeah. organizations because they need to think, okay, well, that's a really good question. Why are we doing that? Is there a reason? Um, and that can lead to some discoveries on the client side. So anyway, back to your question, some time gets spent talking to clients, figuring out what do people need and why do they need it? Um, we spend quite a lot of time working with uh, our product team and our NLP engineering team. So yeah. we're always trying to make things efficient for we localize. So that means how are we going to actually, you know, dispatch work to our workforce? How are we going to pay people for these things that they're doing? How are we going to integrate in super cool um, NLP technology to, you know, make the work better, faster? So lots yeah. of those kinds of conversations. Um, and then we also spend a lot of times with our delivery teams because they need yep. to understand not, you know, they need to understand the tooling that we're building for them and help to understand what is this data, not just, you know, we're not about just delivering a service. We're about understanding the service and really being, um, you know, doing it in a mindful way that is respects, you know, the underlying value of the work that we're delivering. What do you think makes a, success, a successful program? Um, I think the most success, you're talking about client programs? Yeah. Yeah. I think a successful program from the client side is one that understands why it's doing the things that it's doing. As I was alluding to before, um, I think there's a real risk right now where client organizations are excited about AI because it's like the hot new topic Certainly and is. they'll say, well, let's just do some AI, AI, just do it. Let's make some AI happen, right? <laughs> Which is not a good reason to do AI. 
um, AI is a tool to produce a certain result that you want or a certain kind of experience. So clients who know what kind of experience they're targeting um, yeah. or what kinds of gains they're looking for. So, you know, we have a client uh, who's building a, a text-based chatbot. How are you going to measure success on your side? Is it yeah. that you want to lower the number of human customer support tickets? Is it that you want to improve the speed of resolution of a ticket in your customer support? So what's going to be the measure of success? Why are you doing the thing that you're doing? Um, so that's one piece. Uh, the other piece is, is successful programs understand, and this is really about multilingual AI, right? Yeah. Because that's what we specialize in. Um, programs that understand the difference between translating stuff and building multilingual AI. That is a really, really key um, distinction that often is lost. Yeah. Uh, because usually when we think multilingual and when large organizations think multilingual global, they're like, oh, get the localization team to do it. They do languages. They do that stuff, right? But localizers generally don't know very much at all about AI. They don't yeah. know very much about data as a deliverable. Um, they don't understand how language manifests in a data set yeah. versus published content on your website or a UI for your product, right? Yeah. So I think those are the keys. Um, and then beyond that, it's you know all the typical things of communication and collaboration and solving problems together and like, you know, figuring out what's the right balance of cost, time, speed, you know, like, but that goes with pretty much every service industry thing. You know, you, if you can't have it all, you can't have speed with super low cost and super high quality. That's just, they don't happen that way. So I wish it would definitely help me when I'm speaking to customers, if I could present on three. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we try, right? I mean, we do our best. That's part of what my job is, is to say, how can we maximize quality yeah. while speeding it up and by keeping it as inexpensive as possible? Um, and we do our best, but you know, you got to know what you need, right? So if you, if you need the data to be perfect, you might have to pay a little bit more and it might take a little bit longer. Um, if you're willing for the data to have a pretty high degree of um, non-compliance, which yep. is often fine, that's often all right, because this is data, it's not translation, yep. then yeah, maybe we can go faster and maybe we can go cheaper. But that's a, you know, it's important to be able to have a frank conversation about those things. Yeah, it's something I, uh, I'm definitely very passionate about. So enough about work. What about you? How did you end up in AI? What's your background? What's your history? I've had the pleasure of working with you for, it's been over a year and a bit now, right? Like that's gone so quickly since you've joined I know. I know. <laughs> the localized yeah. family. But tell us about Aaron. What's your background? What are you passionate about? All of the fun things. Um, so, I mean, I just, I ended up in language industry generally because I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and all I wanted was to desperately get out of there and go see the world. Um, so, you know, part of my curiosity about the world has been about language, um, but it's also about culture. I'm very, I've always been fascinated to see how do people behave in different cultures. Um, you know, when I travel, I'll often... I rarely will stay at like the conference hotel. I yeah. stay somewhere else and I force myself to take public transit, for example, to see like what what's it like to ride the subway in Tokyo? You know, that's a thing. That's a thing if you live in Tokyo. It's a part of life. It's a part of culture. So, so I've always been fascinated by language culture. Um, I moved to Chile when I was in my still in college and I lived there for five years when I was quite young. Um, yeah. and started a business there teaching English and translating and then doing scientific editing for yeah. um, academics. And basically I just kind of fell into it because that was dot-com age and all of my friends got cool dot-com jobs um, <laughs> while I was, you know, had long hair and was a hippie in Chile. And when I came back, that's what I knew how to do was language stuff. And so one thing leads to another. And I basically had pretty much every job you can think of in 
uh, from language teaching to medical interpreting to voice wow. acting to, you know, pretty much anything in this industry. Um, in terms of AI, I got into AI really by chance because the company that I had founded, you know, 20 years ago in Seattle had some big tech yeah. clients in Seattle, which I won't name names, but um, there's some big tech companies in Seattle that were <laughs> even 20 years ago buying, I don't think any of us sort of called it AI data because machine learning wasn't what it is now, but mm -hmm. data to build algorithms around yeah search relevance, um, product relevance, spell checks, um, text input systems, like what's the most likely input in French if I start with TI, right? So I just kind of, those are the opportunities that showed up. And I think maybe because I love language and culture, I'm like more, and this maybe is a fault, maybe more than I like business, yeah. I like the and culture problems. And so it just kind of fell yeah. into that. Um, and luckily I, you know, started working here at We Localize, at, which is just a great company. And there were some emerging um, opportunities and I jumped right in and it's a great fit. So that's how I've ended up by your side here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love what you do every day. And I think the fact that you're even willing just to jump on LinkedIn Live when I'm like, I need some help. I want to make sure I'm doing a live like instantly and come and uh, have a chit chat and take some time out of your day. I really appreciate it. I'm going to close everything out. All right. See you later.